Well, that's why I like I had to have somebody who was a bigger Bond fan than me because like <laughs> I like Bond, you know, like I'm not like somebody who's like doesn't like it, but I've never been like obsessed with it, you know, or like a huge like Bond or like you know, I know some fan like the fandom and shit around it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And when how, you told me you were an, when you told me you were an autist, a Bond autist, I was uh <laughs> I was like, "Oh, this has to happen." Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I rewatched that movie and I was I was like, man, and I I kind of got confused for a split second because it was like when I was looking it up and I, you know, it was on Max, like all that shit was on like Max right now. I think they have like the whole Bond series up there. And I was like, damn, there's a lot of those. But like, I forgot that it was like 2006 and that it was the first Craig Bond. Yes. And that there was 2006, that like. 2006, that's so long ago. <laughs> yeah. And there was that fucking parody or something of it that came out in like 1967 i was looking up last night i was like hold on did i yes, miss something yeah that's it, yeah that's not very good and there's a version which i've not seen which is a, a tv version um for, it was on cbs in in the late 50s uh but they make him an american agent in that called called jim bond <laughs> <laughs> jim it's the, the american hey jim <laughs> the nickname yeah all right, awesome, yeah. Uh, you know, anything goes, fair game. It's kind of nerdy, so I'm going to go with, like, book first, right? And I yeah. like to, for this podcast, I always say, like, you know, what book or what version you read. And I'm interested in yours, too, because you have a bunch of classic versions of this novel, right? Like 60s and 70s, 50s versions? Yeah, I've got I've got a couple of different versions. Uh, they're actually up in the loft at the moment. Um, but, um, yeah, for, the, for this one, I did the audiobook, uh, although I made sure to get the 2007 audiobook. <laughs> To, to not be the uh, not the censored one. I don't know if they have censored this one in particular. But... Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy. 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 Bored. This is another episode of Heavy Board. I'm Andrew Wittstadt, and I'm joined today by a very special guest who goes by the Nanny State, at the Nanny State, and is the uh, mastermind behind the musical project Wrong Circles, available on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your music. Nanny State, welcome. Hello, nice, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. I've been looking forward to this since we planned it, where I was just like, you know, that announcement on the Bond shit where they're like trying to i guess i call it whitewashing i mean like yeah censor and whitewash all this kind of old novels and shit and then we started talking and i was like okay we i gotta start doing some bond shit hopefully go through the whole series eventually but <laughs> well it's well it's still intact we have to cover it before, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, before they hide it from us and i want to get to that eventually too that fucking the censorship and stuff. like i don't know because it's so hard to read those articles, like what they're actually censoring. I read some of the Roald Dahl stuff, and I was like, I can't stomach this shit. Like, I, I can't read any more of this to see, like, what they're changing and, like, the Bond stuff. Although I was pointing out, like, I'm like, are they changing, like, sexism stuff? Or, like, some of his, like, misogynist, like, remarks and stuff I think like they, that? I think they took a lot of N-words out of Live and Let Die. <laughs> yeah, right. I think there's, there's, you know, because it's full on, like, chap, one of the chapter titles has just got it bang in the, in the middle. I think that uh, they excised that. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm, I've, again, I've not looked into quite what the what the level of the changes are, because it doesn't really matter. Like, if, if once once you've started changing one part of it, then it's all, it's all fair game, isn't it? So it's, yeah, that's why uh, important to to read them while you still can exactly we are here uh listeners to correct the record on uh, james <laughs> bond but i wanted to start this out in any state with uh just like your background a little bit with like uh with bond as a reader all that kind of stuff were you always a big reader as a kid growing up you know what got you into bond all that kind of shit yeah um so bond i would have the first experience of bond would have been watching i think like the last half hour of um for your eyes only 
and then a couple of years later, my dad sort of properly introduced him to, my, to Bond because he's a he's a massive Bond fan and has been since he was a little kid. Um, and I had some of the books on on tape when I was a kid. I had Live and Let Die and Diamonds Are Forever on tape, read by Joanna Lumley. And I used to listen to those over and over again. Um, and then when I was a bit older, uh, going away on holiday to France, I'd, I'd, I'd read the uh, the Bond pan paperbacks uh, on holiday. And so they just yeah went through all of them. Um, but yeah, I'm a huge Bond fan, <laughs> um, and particularly of, of the Bond books because it's not it's not an area of Bond that gets discussed that much. And I think you know, the the portrayal of Bond is very different in the books, and it's 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 not what people think of when they think of James Bond, and particularly in this book as well. I think in Casino Royale, it's um, yeah, it's a very different Bond to, to what people think of. Yeah, I want to get to that too in terms of like the cultural like this guy, like this character that became bigger than life, you know, like the James Bond character. But you were saying your dad was a big Bond guy. Were you a boomer dad, right? I, we're kind of around the same age. Right? Uh, Gen X. Gen X dad, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, my parents were always yeah. older, yeah. And they had like boomer parents and my dad was, I mean, every person that grew up in that era, like you idolize James Bond, Look. Yes, absolutely, yeah. It's, um. Yeah, it's it's the first British action hero, really. Like that <laughs> yeah. goes worldwide. Like you know, there's sort of there's sort of boys' adventure stories before that stuff, but it's the first. Yeah, it's probably the first British British action hero, and I'm still one of the only ones, really. But, yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Like, I just like the capture that like this character. And we talk about it on this podcast all the time because, you know, we're writing a book podcast, but we are talking movies here today too, listeners. But it's just like this character of James Bond and like us coming to it even like, you know, decades after it was first introduced and just the grip it's had on like the kind of all spies are based around James Bond, like after 1953 or whatever, when this book came out, you know, like every spy is based on this guy now. Yeah, like, yeah it's the default. Isn't it? It's uh... And I think I think every uh, every man sort of compares himself to James Bond <laughs> as well. It's you know it's sort of yeah you know, it's a true masculine archetype, isn't it? His yeah you know, his figure. Yeah, I want to get to that too. That this like I would say, and I want to hear what you think about this. Where I said Bond is the most in, kind of iconic, and I would also say like important spy character of the 20th century. I mean, maybe even ever. But like, I just wanted to. What do you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. He's he's the default spy. When when people think of spies, they're thinking of James Bond. And uh, yeah, it's it's all that it's all there in this book as well. Like everything that you would associate with you know, the the dossier being delivered, with all the breakdowns of the 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 different people that he's going to be meeting and what their involvement are, and and the car chase, like everything that you would think of in a spy in a spy is all contained in the, in this novel. Yeah. yeah, and it was the first introduction, so that's what always, like, whenever I read a book like this, and, you know, because people, I'm a millennial, and this fucking shit, when I, like, I was introduced to Bond, like, the first Bond I knew was, you know, Pierce Brosnan as James mm -hmm. Bond, like, the 90s James Bond, and then, like, I had never read any of the books, and then reading this book, uh, shit, listeners, I didn't even get into it, I read... It was a newer edition that came out in 2012 here, but the original edition was published in 1953, I believe. Yeah. The first time. And of course, these are, you will find these types of paperbacks all over the world in used bookstores, you know, nice patinaed pages. Like Nanny State showed me a few pictures of uh, his collection. He's got nice, like, classic uh, paperbacks with that yellowed uh, pages and. Uh, crinkled corners yeah. and all that they smell great as well they've yeah. got sort of rye ergot sort of smell to them yeah. <laughs> oh yeah who who is that writer that said that he said like like new books smell great he's like old books smell even better like ancient egypt or something oh oh yeah i'm not sure is it like bradbury or somebody i think it was like a sci-fi guy that was like something hmm. like yeah that. it sounds like it could be bradbury yeah. But yeah, this is fucking great, man. Uh, and I, I was thinking like, okay, and this was the first time this iconic character, like you already heard us say it, listeners, this iconic character was brought to life. And I'm sure Fleming had no idea about how big this would be at this point in his life. And I guess this was kind of the end of Fleming's life, too. We didn't even really talk about Fleming and like him being an icon in his own right. Yeah, so he'd he'd been in in naval intelligence beforehand, and and sort of you know, Bond is is 
I think the idealized version of, of Fleming, but it's yeah, he, he shares a lot of his traits, but also, you know, he's, he goes much further than, than Fleming ever did. Um, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a great introduction to, to him as a character. I think like it's one of the, uh, it's one of the only Bond books that starts with him already on the mission. Almost all the other ones start with him going to meet M, but he's right, he's right in the middle. And I love that he does that thing that, I think all all men do in the, in the very opening scene where he's uh, he's looking at the the bank clerks behind the the desk of the casino and he's thinking oh how would you how would you rob it if you now would you need three you need three guys with guns then it's it's <laughs> like constantly casing the joint constantly sort of they're thinking about uh, you know what what uh, what would happen if I had to spring into action right right now yeah that's fucking great and also I was thinking and this book isn't super gadget heavy but I was thinking like the gadgets like the importance of like the spies having these gadgets that probably don't exist, right? They're make believe gadgets like this, this, the watches and stuff. I mean, Pierce Brosnan yeah. had like a fucking watch or something in those nineties bonds. And then like some devices. And I guess this was the fifties. So the tech wasn't what we would consider today, but it was still like the most advanced tech you could get. And I was just thinking like, yeah, like we start getting this 1950s tech right away where he's getting like this kind of rundown of this is what you can do, this is what you can use, you know, cyanide tooth caps or whatever. Like this oh, is just one that's got a button that's that's potassium cyanide, isn't it? And and there's two like camera cases, there's the camera cases in it as well, that sort of bomb, trick bomb camera cases. And yeah, it's uh, it's all quite grounded at the, at the beginning. I mean, it remains quite grounded throughout the books. That's it doesn't, doesn't veer into science fiction territory as much as the films ever do. Yeah, that's what I noticed when I was rewatching the film last night. Of uh, We're talking just Casino Royale listeners, but, you know, there's no rules. We're going to be going all over the place with Bond and shit and the culture. But I was noticing that, too, because they had, like, that huge, like, hour-long intro to it, basically, in, like, the, in, like, the movie in 2006. That, yes. like, it isn't, doesn't really start off like the book does. And, you know, whatever, right? Like, you have to take some creative license when you're adapting a novel into a different form. But, like, yeah. There is like less of that in in the movie version a little bit. Yeah, it's um, I mean, it's very it's it's quite brief the book really in terms of it's but not only is it very short but it's very few scenes really. So you know the whole book is happening maybe in in sort of seven scenes maybe like it's really just him being introduced him at the casino the the card game the torture scene the the bit at the end really that's that's the whole book. It's like, considering how sprawling the James Bond adventures are on, on screen and some of the later ones, how you know they're hopping between countries and stuff. This, this really is like you know, almost a play, isn't it? It's happening over a few, just a few scenes. I noticed that too. And that's something I want to say too, just how, not just like how simple the plot is. Like, it's kind of crazy that it's about like a fucking card game. Like most of the fucking book, like the first hundred pages are about a card game essentially. Yeah. And then like, have you, um, no, have no, you yeah. done Moonraker yet? Have, have, you, read, have you read Moonraker? I've yeah, read the that, first That four, takes the yeah. card games to another. <laughs> At least Baccarat, you can sort of get your head around what's going on in the card game. But yeah, the bridge stuff in Moonraker... Oh. yeah and i don't know how to play cards at all yeah <laughs> so i don't know how to play like any fucking card games blackjack maybe yeah. uh of course in the in the film they make it texas hold'em which is obviously much more understandable to your average audience member but significantly less classy than playing baccarat yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i did notice <laughs> that too yeah they made it like a poker yeah. game instead of uh it, but i was thinking like yeah like okay these it's really simple and these were like it's incredibly clean too. Just like the writing, like Fleming didn't add any extra flourishes. He didn't like do these little, you know, stylistic like quirks or anything. He was incredibly clean. You can tell he loved Hemingway. You can tell he loved yes. all these great guys. He was reading them. And uh, I guess he basically set the template for a spy novel too. I guess there were like pulp, pulp novels and stuff before that and all that, but it's Fleming, very, um, yeah, it almost reads like a telegram at, at points, that, and like, but then he'll he'll occasionally sneak a phrase there. Like a lot, a lot of it isn't very flowery, but then he has like that. There's a uh, in halfway through Casino Royale, there's a line about um, the hands of a clock stumbled their way through the afternoon. And he just has a little turn. Oh, what's he? Oh, you're you're a better writer than you than you seem. Um, yeah, but his um, yeah, the style is kind of like that early scene where Bond goes back to his hotel room and he wants to check if 
it's been disturbed and he's and it just like the way he just goes through that list of all the uh all the different things he's like he's scratched a little th- uh, bit on the cistern of his um toilet to see if the water's changed at all it's there and he's put like one of his black hairs across the uh the drawer of the dresser to see if it's been disturbed and um yeah it's uh it's so well uh well conveyed by fleming his prose it's like and it's like those classic little like simple like almost i I guess i read an interesting essay once by ross mcdonald and and i'm a big pulp guy i know you and i have talked a little bit about classic pulp novels and stuff just chatting and stuff online and it was like he always said it went back to poe like mcdonald would always argue that like those Mm -hmm. simple kind of hide the document behind the drawer type thing like went back to some early like purloined letter you know like edgar Allan poe stuff uh I mean, I don't know if that, I don't know if how true that is or not, but I was like, oh, that's interesting theory. That's the kind of those simple, just little spy tricks, notch the, notch the toilet, right? Notch the thing, put a hair over the, the lock, uh, tape, tape the book to the underside behind, you know, pull the drawer out, tape the book underneath and put it back in or whatever. And yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful. And it's, it's proper spy craft, isn't it? Again, it's like no, no gadgets. It's all it's all stuff that you could do if you, you know, if you wanted to stay in the hotel and you wanted to check if it had been disturbed. You, you know, it's the average reader could start trying that out tomorrow. And there's like yeah. the, like that final part too, where there's like that fucking with, with the check when they're looking for the check and they can't find it and they rip the room to shreds looking for the check. And then he's just like, oh yeah, I, I hit it like behind the placard of the numbers on the outside of the room or whatever. Yes, <laughs> like brilliant. it just. So yeah. simple, but yeah, like it's just like the purloin letter. Like, the, what was that? They like put it in uh, in plain sight, right? Like hide it in plain sight. Like it's mm. just a normal letter, and then nobody thinks that it's hidden, and they can't find it all of a sudden. Yeah. Damn, I have so many things that I want to touch on before we even get to like specifics in the book and shit. But I was just like, fuck <laughs> Bond girls. The fucking I want to talk to you about that. The importance of the Bond girls and the movies. Like we talked a little bit, but like the movies, the cultural impact of that the hot girls like yeah she, i mean so this is you know the original one and this one with vespa lind who like um I, and again i think F- fleming's fleming's bond girls are, are you know they're definitely stronger characters than the, the bond girls in the in the films are they're you know they're not bimbos like a lot of them are a lot of them are secret agents or are you know uh, you know, we come from a sort of life of crime, or sort of you know, come from the streets. So they're they're, they're all um, they're all a lot tougher than you than you think of when you think of a, a Bond girl. Like, well, also, all obviously being beautiful and sort of slightly fetishistic. They're they're not um, they're not damsels in distress most of the time. They're usually partners. Yeah, like they usually help. Like they're he needs them in most of the plots. You know, and I guess he falls in love with them too. But yeah, yes, I highlight there's this quote here. He says. Uh, he was quite honest to himself about the hypocrisy of his attitude towards her. As a woman, he wanted to sleep with her, but only when the job had been done. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, highlight, I think I highlighted that exact fucking phrase, too, like on, the, on, the, on the my version where... It, my first introduction, and like I said, I was a Pierce Brosnan Bond. Like I, you know, when you're born in like the fucking '90s, and then you go like, "Oh, the Bond mm-hmm. movie," it's just Pierce Brosnan doing all of it. My first one was, I think, what was it like, um, "Tomorrow Never Dies" or whatever with the Halle that's, Berry. That's his. His uh, no, that's Die Another Day with Halle Berry. Die Another Day. That was the one I remember yeah. first because I just remember that scene with Halle Berry coming out of the ocean and like her tits and just like this kind of like I remember <laughs> being like you know like a ten, thirteen year old boy just being like, oh my god, <laughs> like this like this woman is so <laughs> the, the, the hot. The sex scene where he's feeding her olives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it became uh, like my a favorite trope. bit of, of Die Another Day is when he. Yes, definitely. The, 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 my favorite bit in Dine of the Day is when he uh, he uses that guy in the wheelchair as a distraction. He just grabs a guy in the wheelchair and just pushes him into a hole. <laughs> God damn. Because that too, like, you know, I, listeners, a lot of listeners probably know this and stuff, but like, there were only like, what, 14? I think Lemming wrote 14 novels with Bond. Uh, th- that sounds about right, yes. Uh, and there's 27 movies, I think, that have been made since like the 60s. Yeah, and and quite a lot of them don't share much in common with the books of the beyond the titles. Like the first few sort of um, Connery ones are, are sort of faithful, and then then they just go off <laughs> off the rails. Are you a, are you a, are you a, a Connery uh, purist? 
True. No, not not a purist. I, you know, I think there's something to be said for for all eras of of Bond. I think you know, I, I love a lot of the Connery runs, but also Live and Let Die, Man with the Golden Gun, they're both fantastic. And uh, yeah, they've all 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 the Bonds have got something that they bring bring to it. Yeah, I know that's um, a contested thing, uh, at least on the, you know when you're online and shit. Do you do you ever? Um... I like the critical drinker, that uh, guy who reviews movies on YouTube. He's like Scottish. Oh, yes. Uh, he did like a great thing. I think it was like a year ago or so where he just went through all the different Bond iterations and kind of ranked them. You know, it's all his opinion, like how he thinks. But I didn't know. I know everybody has strong opinions about which Bond is the real Bond, you know. like the. In terms of the best... Uh... The, the best of the films, I think, is from Russia with Love as an actual film, just as a the best film. My favorite is uh, You Only Live Twice. God, yeah, my dad was always the one that got me. You know, I remember watching Doctor No. Mm. My dad, when all like the DVD re-releases were happening, like, and my dad would like we'd get them for him for like Father's Day or some bullshit. You know, like, oh, here's a DVD version that we already have on VHS or whatever it is, and then like, I just remember yeah, watching you, it on the couch. Yeah. You Only Live Twice was one of the first three DVDs that, that we got. I remember when my, my, the Christmas that my dad bought a DVD player. It was You Only Live Twice, Spinal Tap, and a, a collection of four Twilight Zone episodes were the first three three DVDs that we ever had. And the Only Live Twice one was like an interactive menu, which I've never seen before. It was like the, the, the volcano opening up as the menu of the DVD. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. Yeah. DVD menus. I know there's like a nostalgia factor online. Everybody brings it up all the time. But yeah, there was something to that, like some cool... Mm dvd menus and shit the music that would kick on and shit and like it would be like soundtrack music and yeah that was fucking great yeah fucking great but we talked a little bit about this <coughs> just chatting back and forth while we were prepping for this and uh about like the decadent food there's like an emphasis oh, yeah. on food and bond even goes out of his way to explain to like vesper at one point like why he eats this like fancy food yeah, so it makes a point of, of telling her that you always need to order extra toast when you're getting caviar because they always bring enough caviar but they don't bring enough toast it's just like, yeah it's, yeah it's like not only is he you know, it's, it's that thing he's always already familiar with all of this sort of fancy food it's not you know he's not impressed by it he's already sort of customizing saying, well, they'll bring extra toast please so that the champagne yeah stuff like he's constantly yes. talking about the champagne and how they need it and pre-dinner cocktails post-dinner cocktails uh <laughs> you know the champagne with the meal yes yeah um but yeah the food is um is a huge part it's it's only a little bit in this one but some of the later ones it gets <laughs> ridiculous descriptions of meals but yeah like um you know, this is he says fifty three. This one came out, so this is like bef a year or two before rationing ends in the UK. So at that point, like you still have rationing. So there's only a you're only allowed a certain amount of meat per week. You're only allowed a certain amount of dairy per week, and you have to like trade in your coupons at the shop. And so um, the idea of just all this sort of luxurious food is like you know, people vicariously enjoying that through through the book because like nobody in Britain's getting caviar and toast at that at that point. And um, you know it's about twenty years before people that are taking trips to to Europe and stuff so that most most people have never left the country most people have never been to to the south coast of France so they 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 almost act like like travelogues for for the reader like you know, describing these food and this locales and and yeah yeah and that's what Nanny Nanny brought this up to me and I was like oh shit like I didn't even consider that you know like and and, and reading it you know going backwards and reading something from 1953 now it doesn't even click with me but then when you said that, that like, yeah, like this was actually, you know, keep in mind that yeah, there was still rationing going on post-World War II, basically. all Because, I mean, people always forget that, too. I mean, you know, fucking parts of the UK just leveled after, you know, rubble yeah. at the end there. So there was all these cities that had to be rebuilt. <laughs> like there was no, like, going to the grocery store. And it's just, yeah, so I never even thought of that. So I was like, yeah, fuck, that's... That's important. And I think that's true for most novels. Like, you know, like Bond, everybody wants to do like these theory, these feminist theory or something against Bond or whatever. But like, it is a fantasy, you know, like, and even something as simple, like you said, like rich foods, decadent foods like caviars and these, these champagnes and even the locales, like, like, you know, the vacation regions of France and shit that they're supposed to be in. And it's just... It is a fantasy, you know. I think people forget yeah, it's, about it's, fiction. It's supposed to be sumptuous, isn't it? You're supposed to be taking it all, taking it all in. Um, yeah. Now I think it's um, 
it's very easy to look down on Bond, but <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, because and and you mentioned this too, like where it's easy to look down on, and we were chatting about it. You said something about how he's actually kind of a cruel character, and that I was like, ooh, that's pretty true, right? Like... Yeah, certainly, certainly in the books, he, he is. I think it is. Um, uh, although I'd also noticed in this in this when I was rereading it that describes him laughing quite a lot of times in the book which is not something that you you get much of in bond in the in the books or the uh, the films but he, he laughs quite a lot in this but yeah i think in general he has a a cruelty and and uh, as much as there is a continuity between the books you could see this one as as maybe this like the start of a lot of that that cruelty that he sort of he does open himself up a bit in this book and then he gets immediately <laughs> it gets very very wrong for him um but yeah there is a um a cruelty and a detachment from from stuff that, that Bond has that I think is um, which I think Daniel Craig captures quite well, probably better than any of the other Bonds. Have. That's interesting. Yeah, that kind of because there is this kind of and I guess it is masculine, like the kind of cruelty or just like when you're living that spy life, right? Like you have to be able to move. And that's always like a trope in spy movies. I, I've been watching a lot. I've been rewatching all the mission impossible movies before I go see mm -hmm. the new one. And I was just like thinking the same thing there, right? Where like in the third movie, it starts to be a huge plot line of like, you can't have normal relationships because you're a fucking spy, dude. Like you're putting your life at risk every time you take a job. And then, you know, you have to lie to your significant other. Like, there's no, like, being honest and open. Like, you're a government spy. Like, you can't even mm. tell them who you really are in some some cases. And you're co constantly having to use people as well and, and sacrifice people. And stuff. And yeah, so I think that, yeah, I think you get, yeah, you get a glimpse of that cruelty in this one. Oh. And, like, the, the sleeping with factor, like, you put it out, I guess that, that quote about, yeah, like, uh, he wanted to sleep with her right away, but only when the job was done. Like, this kind of... <laughs> the male there is something to that you know it's always like a, a thing in literature it's a thing in poems and stuff where people are like, oh you know like the, you fall in love with people you just met or whatever and there's no particular mm. reason or not and i guess everybody does this but when men do it particularly like it's very hard and fast kind of thing you know yeah there's that great description where he talks about um they're talking with uh vespa and i think with is it with mathis the the other uh, spy um and he talks about constantly glancing over to her and, and gesturing to her to include her in the conversation but each time he does he's taking in another glance of her and he's trying to sort of deduce more about her and sort of take in more of her, her visage it's, yeah, it's a really nice description of of when you meet someone that really grasps your your attention and like the dress when he's commenting on her dress like how great it looks and he's like oh no no, no we have to order caviar in that dress like kind of like yes. you know <laughs> That you gotta use it properly. Look at how great you look, kind of thing. Yeah. But that'll keep coming up, listeners, just because it's such an important, you know, because sex is in part is a part of this, and it's part of that fantasy. I guess it's a particularly male fantasy, but you know, people could, you know, women could still participate in it too. Where there's just like, yes. that, yeah, like this suave guy in these great fucking suits, like eating caviar and having these like women throw themselves at him and him banging them and, and then saving the world at the same time. Like he gets all of it, he gets the cake and gets to eat it too. Right. It's a, it's a fantasy. Although in, in this one, he's not saving the world. Is he? He's just, he's bankrupting, he's bankrupting a union. That's the, that's his actual <laughs> mission is there's, there's a trade union in Europe and he's they, they think they're being funded by the Russians. So his job is to bankrupt. <laughs> fighting, fighting the good fight. <laughs> yeah. Oh fuck yeah! One one small thing I kept noticing is uh, the cold showers. The cold. Showers. Oh yeah, a hot bath followed by a cold shower. That's what he takes. When I was like, well, "What's up with the cold showers? Like, why are the cold showers?" I know my. Is that just like an old old thing? Like. Yeah, I guess wait in the morning it wakes you up, doesn't it? And I guess it um, it's probably good for the skin. But, yeah, but I think also there's probably a masochistic element for it for Bond. It's you know. That's what I was it's thinking a, too. Yeah, it's like a it's like a tough guy type. I can take it. Like this is how yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, and like, you know, that probably serves him well when he's when he's getting tortured later on. That he's sort of you know he's bracing himself every morning with a cold shower. And I did wonder because I remember my grandfather, R.I.P. He died many years ago, but I remember him always talking about cold showers in the morning. I don't know if it was just some you know guys from that era, like the you know 
who were, he would have been, I guess Bond would technically be a little older than my grandfather would have been in that time. Although I think in the fifties, he, my grandfather was probably in his thirties, forties, but it was like mm. this, the cold showers were just like a part of it. Like he would always say like every morning he would start really hot and then go as cold as it'll go. Like kind of thing at the end of the shower, but just to like wake himself up. And I'm just like, is that just like a 1950s like thing that people were doing? <laughs> like, or is it supposed to be this kind of, yeah, Bond's a tough guy. He can take what, a little cold water, you know, like, dipping your toe in the pool fuck that put the cold water right over your head you know like, <laughs> yeah i was definitely. just like and it keeps coming up like he keeps mentioning that like he's doing these cold showers like, it was a cold shower you know it was cold <laughs> none of this warm stuff yeah uh, so did you want to go through what uh the 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 events the, cause it's... i did i wanted the card game especially since that's like the main plot like like yes the significance yeah. of it like, what do you think of it? Like, in terms of, you know, why is this card game the most, most of the plot, really? Yeah, I suppose it's something, it's obviously something that Fleming's really into. He's obviously very into to cards. And so for him, it's very exciting. I think, I would say that the card game in the book is more exciting than the card game in the film. I think in the film, that it stops and starts so many times. By the time you get to the climactic part of the the card game in the film, you it, you've already had that sort of climax happen twice already, whereas it's um, it's fairly sort of uh, in the in the, in the book it, it sort of just comes to one big crescendo. Yeah, yeah. I think in Do the you, book um, it's you... described as like four hours or something, right? Like four or five hour game that they have a few breaks in the middle of, but then not like in the movie it almost makes it seem like it lasts a couple of days. Like, and yeah, all and this he has time to get out in between. To his car and yeah. He, yeah, changes clothes you, a bunch you... of times. <laughs> do you have any familiarity with with Bakura before before no. reading this i have no idea i even after reading it i was still a little like wait a minute so how do you score these cards like <laughs> how many yeah. points are these worth like so nines aren't <laughs> worth nine they're worth, like kind yeah. of like i was like okay uh but yeah i was just thinking too it's kind of it's almost it, i guess it's kind of funny too when you, when you look back like the government's because he concludes it with the okay mi6 like you know the british intelligence and then with the cia the american intelligence apparatuses and they're like giving up millions like they're like giving him millions of dollars to risk on a card game like you know like it's like yeah just because huge... he's the best gambler like yeah <laughs> like, i like that. also they don't try and use any of their spy craft in the casino they just like <laughs> no he's just really good at cards he's just you know. <laughs> Yes. But I was thinking that too. Like, I was like, okay, what's the significance of it? Like, why, how does a card game become like the main focus of a fucking spy novel? And I was thinking, okay, risk, right? Like, it shows that there's balls, this kind of risk. Like, they're risking millions of dollars, government dollars to do this, like, kind of. And he loses it at one point, too, you know? Like, that's. Yeah, like, and the CIA have to bail him out. <laughs> and it's like, it's bold. It's it's fucking it 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 could fail right like he's taking chances and it's kind of like you don't even think about it where you're like oh it's just a card game but then it's like yeah they're actually banking so much on this card game like you said just for the skill level of this one spy that they have you know an arsenal of spies very cold yeah. war I guess or is it just supposed to show like the ballsiness the the attitude the kind of like yeah this is what intelligence agencies do is like sometimes <laughs> yeah, we do risk it all like 25 mil on a fucking card game because that's the <laughs> only way to do it you know that kind of thing or I don't know yeah. I was just fascinated yeah your thoughts yeah it's yeah it's it is it is an odd mission when you think about it for for the first for for especially yeah given how how grand some of the bond plots will get later on how you know that it's yeah you're gonna go to france and you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna bankrupt the union by by playing a card game against a really reckless man yeah it's um it's quite it's quite small stakes globally despite being high stakes financially it's it, it feels like if, if Bond loses all their money, it, n nothing really changed. Like, <laughs> the, yeah, the Cold War pretty much carries on as it would otherwise. Yeah, that is crazy too. Like the kind of the stakes escalate, and you, and you mentioned it already too. Like this is the shortest of the Bond books. I think this is less than two hundred pages in my version. I guess it depends which you know paperback version you get printing. But I noticed the other ones. There, this one's under two hundred pages in my version, but. Um, I noticed like Moonraker and then yeah, like Live and Let Die and, and like the the following novels 
are all a little bit longer. They start to get a little bit longer, a little bit longer as the plots start to get a little bit more high stakes. You know, then you get to Moonraker where like the whole world's at stake. You know, he's saving the yeah. world. Marvel movie, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah and the, 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 the amount of locations in each one starts increasing as as well. Um, and also I think, you know, with this one, it, the, the sort of spy part of the plot finishes quite a bit before the actual book ends that's you know it's it's a fair fair chunk at the end of just him and vesper after the um you know there's not there's not really a climactic climactic battle with the with a with a final villain that's one thing i noticed too yeah like the villain is almost like a comedy character in in this in this novel because then some of the later novels they're much more serious and much more sinister but like it's almost something a bit pathetic about him, isn't he? Like they, when they, when they're going through the do- dossier and this sort of thing, they they invested all these in all these brothels, and then a the month later, the the French outlawed brothels, and they lost all his money, and now he's sort of gambling, and, and you know, and he seems so desperate when he's trying to get the money off of bonds and stuff. But yeah, he's yeah, he's a bit more of a pathetic figure than than most of the other villains. And you get some of those like weird villains that have like world domination shit. Like, yeah, this guy's just like a gambling addict that has like a debt to pay and. Yeah, he's just trying to bail himself out, isn't he? Because he's because he's gambled away some of KGB's money. In the height of the cold, I guess this was like right at the start of the Cold War too. And like being a kid that was you know '90s kid, like Cold War meant nothing to me. You know, like growing up, but yeah. I know for generations before me, it meant so much. <laughs> like it was such a yeah, huge and it's deal. it's you know, it's such a huge part of Bond. So that that you know, that Cold War backdrop. And that sort of the spies, spies being an active part, despite the fact that there wasn't really people like James Bond at the time. You know, there wasn't, as far as we know, there, they, there was there was so many moles within uh, British intelligence um, that they just couldn't risk having any spies because they just kept getting killed. So they just ended up not really having them. There was loads of Russian spies in in the UK. But there was no there's no English spies really. That's interesting. And I don't know enough about like the history of it too, but like, that's very interesting because they don't teach you so much. I mean, shit in America, like we literally, you do not learn anything but like U S history basically. Yeah. But it's like, you know, we're definitely not talking about what the British were doing during the cold war. <laughs> They're talking about what like the uh, CIA was. So that's always fascinating. Out of interest, yeah. how, how big is, how, how big a cultural force is bond in America? I'm never quite sure how, how much, how much you, and obviously the, the movies obviously do, do well over there, but, I mean, day to day, how much is Bond informing American life? It's interesting. I think it's it's less than he used to or less than mm-hmm. a fictional character could. But, you know, I think there is something. And Nanny State and I always kind of chat about this just, you know, online when we're chilling and we'll see something, you know, whenever somebody's talking about like America versus England or something, we'll like chat. And I'm like, yeah, like... I, I think there is a romanticizing about the British too in America. So I think yes. that, that, that helps that helped James Bond be a huge figure. Like, like I think it was JFK that like publicly said in the sixties that like from Russia with love was his favorite novel yeah. or whatever. And uh, you know, that kind of suave kind of educated and the accent helps, right. It's very, mm-hmm. and at least in America, we treat it as like, a novelty or like a posh like high class thing right and then, uh, so he, he treats it like a qualification <laughs> <don't he? laughs> fucking science experiment he, he equals like. one american phd having a british <laughs> just like fake it the people will just fake it for class like john oliver isn't really british dude he just like <laughs> we just love hearing it from a british person like we're just like oh they must be really fucking <laughs> they must know yeah. like, so there's that but i think he has and I guess it's different too because he's he, Bond is supposed to be like a, a fictional British hero, and in America, I mean, he he's a hero, I think too. But I think it is a little bit less than it was even maybe like fifteen years ago. I don't know if it's just because I was younger and a kid. It just feels like the Bond brand maybe isn't as important or as cool even than like it maybe it was when I was growing up watching, like I said, Halle Berry come out of that ocean water with her tits and like. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people. That I know aren't aren't that into Bond. A lot of people from my my generation just not. You know, I think they they view it very much as something a bit old fashioned and a bit a bit campy and a bit sort of um, yeah. I think yeah, sort of stuffy. I suppose. That's interesting, and I I wonder too if like, is it just because the movies in like the last fifteen years weren't as good as like the older movies, or is it because you know? 
there's just so much stuff now. You know, you could have the Marvel heroes and stuff. You don't have to have this kind of dashing spy character. We have millions of spy characters now. You know, I just thought Mission Ethan Hunt, the American kind of spy character. Yeah. But that's not it. Like, even Ethan Hunt, he did not have the cultural cachet, the cultural importance that James Bond did. Over yeah, the not, as, not as an individual figure. Right. Not, no. Like, B- Bourne is probably the closest you get, isn't it? And, yeah, and it, it's kind of, I, 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 I don't know why it is. I mean, and then you see all the stuff. I wanted to get to this, too, where, where we're, we're seeing a lot of this. They're, they're trying to whitewash the books. They're trying to do a female James Bond. Like They're trying to, you know, like recast, like, kind of his legacy or the legacy of the fiction. You know, once a character grows beyond a certain point, like it is is bigger than life you know so if you make any changes to it as if it's just a fictional character that you can do whatever you want with it's like no it's more than that now like bond has you know over the last 70 years has become more than just like a, a fictional spy character yeah i i know that they've, there's lots of there's always lots of talk about them doing a a, a female bond or, or a different race bond or i i always think that they're, they're not going to do that because that stuff might play okay in the west but there's a huge international audience for bond and like bond fans in malaysia don't want a female bond i don't think i think they want they've got a very set idea of what what bond is and so i think i think bond's fairly safe as a as him as a figure of 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 yeah of much tinkering really i think he'll he'll always sort of have to be bond i could be completely wrong but i just think the international market for it is is so big and that that market is not for a subversion of Bond or a reinvention of Bond. It's for it's for Bond, uh, you know, the guy in the in the tuxedo. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't even realize. Think about that, like the international appeal. Like you could go to anywhere in the world and mention the name James Bond in English, and everybody that doesn't even fucking speak English would know what you're talking about. They would picture Connery or Bronson or somebody, you know, in that tux. And they would know exactly yeah. what you mean. Like kind of that's special. Like that is not that doesn't happen every day. Like that has to be decades of like a character coming back up and being beloved in all these different parts of the world, all these different cultures. They still love it. Like Yeah. But I was thinking that too, because you know, yeah, there's all this talk. There's all this fucking talk about yeah, making it a woman or something. And I was just thinking, I was like, would a woman, would like a female James Bond even work? Like, would it even work? Because I feel like it would change so much of the dynamics. Like, I mean, it's not James Bond at that point. And I don't mean that's all oh, they've changed. I just mean, it literally isn't. I mean, James Bond is, you know, it's James Bond. As soon as you make it a woman, it's something else. It's, you know, it's a different, it's a different thing, which could be great. It could be a great thing, but it's not, not going to be James Bond. <laughs> Because it, it changes. I, uh, yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah, I I, I think you'd, you'd probably want to do, you know, if you because they're probably going to reboot them again, aren't they? The, the films. I think you know, do them as period pieces, set them in the fifties and the sixties when the when the books are are done. It's the only way to to make it feel fresh anymore. Really, I think. Right. Honestly, that sounds fucking great. I was thinking that when I was watching the movie rewatch, you know, because I'd seen it when it came out and seen it a few other times, but I rewatched it for this. And, and I was thinking that too, like I was like, they set it in present day 2006. So the tech and all, they had to add these kind of tech scenes into the, the Casino Royale movie adaptation. And I was like, man, you know, if they did set it in like 53 or something or 54, like if they set it at like the French 1950s, Man, that could have been really cool. That could have been really romanticized. It could have been the cigarettes. I noticed they don't let him smoke. What did they stop yeah, having Bond yeah. smoke? I don't know. I'm not a big yeah. enough Bond artist, but yeah, I think I think if you set them then as well, you you get rid of the problem of um, yeah, of of, of the tech and uh, it just yeah, it just would feel it would feel fresh. It would feel different, and it would feel um, you could do them smaller scale and and yeah. You, you, know, you can still have them being exciting and have them be good, be good spy films, but yeah, I don't know how much appetite there is for because it, it have it has to compete with with Mission Impossible and with and with Fast and the Furious to be honest. Like that's right. that's doing you know Fast and the Furious is the they're the um, 
the inheritor of like the you know the Roger Moore era Bond films. They're sort of winking to the camera kind of action spy films that they're they've they've sort of picked up that mantle and stuff. And so you rather than competing against that, I think just lean into the spy bit rather than the action. Yeah. And I was thinking like, okay, if we do that, like, and then if we had a woman come in, like it changes the sexual dynamics one, which people say doesn't matter. But I think that matters. Like the fact that he's a horny guy that like can be seduced by beautiful women. Like that's one of his big weaknesses, right? Like, yes. (laughs) And like, so we take that away from this character. He has to have huge weaknesses. Like he has to have weaknesses or like, it's not going to be a fun story with this spy having, you know, trials and tribulations and conquering. And then, I think the other thing you would do if you if you rebooted it to set them at the time is you get rid of mobile phones, which have ruined the spy genre as much as they've ruined the horror genre and so many other genres. Because so many stories don't work in a world where people have mobile phones. You know, most of the most of the problems in most of the Bond books could be solved with an iPhone. <laughs> right when you have a cell phone that pings off a tower every fifteen minutes to like yeah. give you your exact location to law enforcement, like. A local cop could find your location yeah. off of like this international spy. Like, yeah, that's fucking. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at Patreon.com/slash Heavy Board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard. And I guess people hit it for the sexism, right? So they hit it for the racism and the sexism because it was 1950s. Yeah. Yeah, which I think, you know, it's... You've got to view it view it in relativity, right? So by modern lens, it's very sexist. But but by the lens of 1953, it's maybe quite progressive, his views on women. <laughs> like he's, you know, as soon as he, as soon as he sits down with... Because when he hears that he's going to have to team up with a woman, he's just like, oh... Fuck say, yeah. But then, yeah. but then when he meets her, he's instantly like, no, actually, she seems cool, and you know, she gets it when I'm explaining the card game to her and stuff. And he's he's instantly won round and really respects her um, as as a sort of fellow agent and stuff. And so, you know, I say like, you know, he it's quite a lot of strong female characters in all the books. And so I think it from by 2023 standards, it's it's um, yeah, it's quite old fashioned. But by old fashioned standards, it's quite modern. And that's, I mean, we made this point already, but like you said, yeah, like they're not helpless. Like the female characters, they're not helpless. And even Vesper in this case is almost like a femme fatale in the vein of like yeah. the classic pulp spy stuff. <clears throat> but I was thinking like specifically like this kind of, like the thing where I'm going to read this paragraph on page 97 in mine where it's right after um, he realizes that Vesper <clears throat> got um, tricked into being kidnapped or whatever. Yeah. Uh, where he says he's like chasing after in the in the Bentley or whatever is like this was just what he had been afraid of, these blithering women who thought they could do a man's work. Why the <laughs> why the hell couldn't they stay at home and mind their pots and pans and stick to their frocks and gossip and leave men's work to the men? And now for this to happen to him, just when the job had come off so beautifully, for Vesper to fall for an old trick like that and get herself snatched and probably held to ransom like some bloody heroine in a strip cartoon, the silly bitch. <laughs> yes. yeah where he's just like he's angry at the fact like he's like blaming it the fact that oh they put a woman into this and that makes them vulnerable or whatever but yeah. that's like half that's only at the halfway point and like you said it, it shifts from being this kind of card game into this kind of romance almost femme fatale where they just spend yes. a couple of weeks fucking in like these like resort town or whatever on the beach you know yeah, and then that that whole kidnapping scene as well. We 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 later get a different angle on what's really going on there, and so uh, yeah, it's, she's not actually helplessly being kidnapped. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And his assumption, uh, d- like you said, it almost means like he, he realizes later that his assumption was wrong too. Like this kind of yeah, 
So even by like 2023 standard, you could say like, well, like he he's learning learn. his lesson, right? Like he's learning not to be like a sexist pig or whatever kind of thing. Like <laughs> the silly bitch. Um, yeah. <laughs> how um, as as an American, how how do you feel about Felix Leiter as a character in the? Uh, I always liked him, and he keeps popping up, right? Like, he keeps... Uh... Yes, he's in quite a few of them, yeah. Uh, and I guess eventually... Was it Moonraker where he gets, like, really brutally... Uh, live and Let Die. Live and Let Die, yeah. yeah. Uh, attacked and all that, and it was, like, forever deformed from it. <clears throat> but, like, uh, I liked him. I liked him, and I liked the fact that... Uh... It's funny he was just, like there to like help Bond, because, like, you said, it's about like, him being the best card player, so, like, they're all trying yeah. to accomplish the same thing which is to like hurt this uh organization to bankrupt them and then like they have like all the americans come in and be like yeah have the british guy uh here's 10 here's 10 million to keep <laughs> buy back in. And bond uh bonds is it um good americans are fine people and most of them come from texas <laughs> i remember that line yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I'm not from Texas, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that might have been true in the 50s. I don't know. Tex people from Texas, they love the fact that they're from Texas, by the way. They'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> They'll let you know that they're from Texas a few times. Um, so after the kidnapping, there's the there's the torture scene, isn't there, which is quite a big pivotal point in the in the book. Um, and it's uh, it's quite extreme. For particularly for 1953, and it's and and oddly homoerotic as well. For like the um, he cuts the seat out from a wicker chair, and then he's beating his testicles and ass with a um, a carpet beater. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, and I, um, that's that. That is kind of like yeah, like that's kind of. I remember first reading this book for the first time, and then rereading it now. That that is, it's very brutal, very brutal torture technique. Where like you always hear stories. You know, our my lifetime, it was always the stories from like Guantanamo or like the Iraq yeah. wars. And then but even like when you hear some of these stories of the KGB and the Cold War, like spies, like what they were doing to people, especially the privates, they would always go yeah. after the dick and balls. They would always go after <laughs> like the, the I, toes. Uh, yeah, I picked out this this quote here. And it says, uh, he had been told by colleagues who had survived torture by the Germans and the Japanese that towards the end there came a wonderful period of warmth and languor, leading into a sort of sexual twilight where pain turned to pleasure and where hatred and fear of the torturers turned to masochistic infatuation. It was the supreme test of will, he had learned, to avoid showing this form of punch drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something, yeah, very sort of like, it is quite seductive in a way, the, the torture scene, isn't it? And he's, um, you know, and it's like he's pouring the drink into his mouth and stuff. It's, yeah, it's, um, it definitely plays on that sort of anxiety as well, which I think, like, you know, like now it's easy to laugh, oh, you know, it's, it seems a bit gay, but I think that's almost part of the, so to speak, the, the, the tension and the horror of it for a 1953 audience that there is this sexual element to it and this sort of homosexual element to it. It's, um, yeah, it adds like, another layer, layer of unease for Bond. And, like, sexual humiliation is such a huge part of so much torture. You can go back to, like, medieval times, oh, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. The racks and, like, just the sexual humiliation that was part of a lot of torture is always... That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it either, that kind of... Yeah, like, and then the Bond after that scene is always worried about, like, will his shit work right? Like, can he get a fucking erection after this? Yes. Like, he's just been, like, beating yeah. his balls and shit, just... <laughs> so like he's like worried about that and yeah. that's that is something you know i think people underestimate that shit where people especially in in today's culture and all you know everybody's dismissive of shit online we're like oh fuck that you know whatever but i'm like yo what if you can't like i know why i understand why hemingway put a shotgun in his mouth when he couldn't get an erection any longer <laughs> like i understand <laughs> yeah. okay like i understand and people are talking about that lightly like that is so important. <laughs> like, that is so yeah, important. I mean, like, particularly for a figure like, like Bond, it would be as well. Right, yeah. yeah. If you can't fuck, so you can't experience one of the most, you know, basic human things on the planet. Like, what's the point? Like, I understand why yeah. <laughs> I mean, why he put that gun in his mouth. <laughs> like, be, you know, like... Eating your cyanide button. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where it's just like, yeah, like, that's... It, it's always... It's having something and then losing it, too. So you know what it's like. You could use it just the other day, and then all of a sudden it's gone. Kind of like yeah. that's 
Oh yeah. <laughs> I understand <laughs> why people get very uh depressed about that and like kill themselves and shit. So that's yeah, that's the section after the the torture scene, is it where it's it's mainly him and Vesper he says staying in a couple of sort of uh resort towns and and drinking and uh, with a sort of growing unease about it and 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 bond having a growing unease about his own role as a spy in that it's, it's sort of it's the first bond book but he's actually deciding to resign towards the end of the book and he's he's having those second thoughts and he speaks to vesper about why he doesn't really want to be a spy anymore and this thing where he says uh Today we are fighting communism. Okay, if I'd been alive 50 years ago, the brand of conservatism we have today would have been damn near called communism. And we should have been told to go and fight that. History is moving pretty quickly these days and the heroes and villains keep on changing parts. And he's sort of, you know, again, like Bond, Bond is more self-reflective than people ever give him credit for. You know, people think of Bond as just this this avatar of, of like British Empire. and And obviously that's part of it, but I think... Particularly in this book, he he really is reckoning with 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 his role as an assassin and, and with the pointlessness of it. And like, like we said, if he if he defeats this guy or he doesn't defeat the Shifra, it it doesn't really matter. Like it's nothing nothing is changing, and he sort of becomes aware of that. In this. yeah, I actually had a question about that. I wanted to talk. About. Yeah, like this his lament right about good and evil. Like when he's been tortured, he's in the hospital. He'd been asleep, for, you know, passed out for days, unconscious. They didn't know he was going to make it. They didn't know if he was going to have his, yeah, like sexual function and all that kind of shit. <clears throat> but, you know, he did that. He literally was sacrificing his sexual function because he was a trained spy where you sacrifice everything to be a mm. spy for the government. But then, like, like you said, this kind of reflection, this kind of good versus evil. Like, what's the point of me doing this? Like, I always thought of myself as a good guy. And like, you know, am I kind of thing, you know? Like and he's, he was... and he's, just, he's just been saved by... A Russian agent as well. Like it's you know one of the the anticlimactic elements of, of the book isn't it? is that he Bond doesn't get to pull the final trigger on the the enemy. He's he's tied to a chair and and there's that wonderfully described sequence that he talks about. Bond noticed that he suddenly had a third eye. That the chief has a third eye and he's and then the eye starts starts bleeding. <laughs> it's, he's been shot, and so yeah, he's you know he has just been saved by his enemy. So he's really questioning it. That's interesting too. With like, I can't. You know, I like pulp stuff. Like, I like Philip Marley, you know, Chandler's stuff. I like, Ross, mm -hmm. I already said, I love Ross McDonald and shit. And, like, you know, very rarely do those types of, like, detective heroes solving the case type thing ever have what Bond had happen, where you said, like, it's just a lot of luck also. Like, Fleming is very careful to show that, like, you know, sometimes the plan doesn't work, and then sometimes you just get fucking lucky. Like... Yeah. He was going to die if this, if the Russian spies weren't after this guy too, basically. And like fortuitous timing just like saved his life essentially. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's, I guess, is that like a realism? Would you say like kind of a... I wonder if it's like a thing. I think it's tying into what, it, to like, if you, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to remember, but like it's, uh, this isn't the first installment of the Bond franchise. It's just a book. Like it now, it's the first installment of the Bond franchise. But when when Fleming's writing it, it's just a book, and so it's just if you think of it as just this one book, that is playing into those themes of Bond's realizations about about his own pointlessness and the pointlessness of, of Spycraft. That I think that 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 it's not um, it's not really his own talent that's that's responsible for any of the the advancements in this beyond being quite good at cards. Right, and he even makes like very <clears throat> potable mistakes in terms of not seeing Vesper for what she is, like not yeah. underestimating the hands at the table and stuff. Like he's he's not a flawless, like I know better than everybody else in the room type character. Mm -hmm. And that would be boring, right? Like if you have just like a know it all character. I mean, you you run into this like with with modern kind of spy and action hero stuff, where we see a lot of movies and shows where. The hero is just infallible, you know, and they're yeah, like a never, superhero. Yeah, and they basically. never make mistakes. Yeah. You can't even they don't even get shot, you know, like or if they get shot, it doesn't matter. Like they can still use mm -hmm. their arm fine, even though the tissue has been blown to shred. <laughs> like, you know, the, yeah. the, the muscle just wouldn't work for weeks, Like, but they can just <laughs> use it. Like, yeah, I mean, but that good versus evil, I think that is. You know, you don't see that so often. And, and I think even now, like they try to make something like a a spy like this, like an evil character, even though like 
but but I mean, I think he's just like Fleming's trying to complicate it and show that it's not so clear cut. You know, it's not so black and white. I know that's a cliche. Everybody talks about it with every fucking issue now. You know, every of a controversy online, <laughs> yeah, but everything's complicated. But it is true. Yeah, you know, um, like it is something there for it. Like, yeah, I think it's it's um, of all of the of all of the Bond books, it's the least it's the least gung ho and it's the least sort of propagandistic really. It's, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's the one that's got the bleakest outlook on spycraft. Yeah. I was thinking that one, the one, and this is when he's talking to Mathis and he's like covered in bandages. Uh, uh, you see, he said, still looking down at his bandages when one's young, it seems very easy to distinguish between right and wrong. But as one gets older, it becomes more difficult. At school, it's easy to pick out one's own villains and heroes, and one grows up wanting to be a hero and kill the villains. Yes, like he was said, he was just saved by one of the people he considered a villain. Like right out, you know, the Russian spy saved him technically. Like, and then told yeah. him, actually gave him kind of ethics in the spy trade too, where he's like, I don't have orders to kill you. That's the only reason you're still alive. Like, because I didn't get mm. the order, and it would be unethical and for me to he's, kill he's... you. <laughs> He's fallen in love with an enemy as well, with with Vesper as well. It's yeah, it's all been it's all been thrown in upside down for him. And, Very um, Shakespearean almost, right? Like falling in love with the forbidden enemy, or like fall. I, mean, I guess he didn't know it, so he didn't know he was falling in love with her, but mm -hmm. and and that she was an enemy. But uh, yeah, it's kind of tapping into those archetypes that Shakespearean like forbidden love kind of. Yeah, and the su the suicide is is similarly tying into that. So um, yeah, so you rewatched the film. Uh, recently what uh what uh what did you think of that the film honestly i had mixed feelings on it um mm -hmm. same <laughs> where like uh i remember liking it when it came out originally uh and then rewatching it now you know almost 20 years later i guess shit like i mm. uh i wasn't as fond of it but uh, no. I still thought there were, you know, like it was still parts where I was like, oh, yeah, I like that. Like it was still like a Bond, you know, movie and it delivered the goods in a lot of ways. But, uh, you know. Yeah, I think Dan Daniel Craig is fantastic in it, I think. But I think the film overall doesn't quite have. Although there's that scene in it where him and Vesper, I think it's after maybe just after kidnapping, they're, they're in the bathroom and he's like he's washing blood off of himself. And he's and she's in the shower, like crying and she's still got the dress on. It's just not a scene you've ever seen in Bond films before where, like, you know, he's really fucked up and he's, like, sort of looking in the mirror. He looks like, look, he's about to cry. And he's cleaning blood off of his face. And, yeah, um, he he isn't sort of calm and collected throughout the whole film, which is... It's not, I think they lean into that idea that because they, they are doing Casino Royale, but they do know it's the first part of a franchise that very much does it as the birth of Bond. Like, he's not Bond at the beginning of the film, and he is Bond by the end of the film, that the sort of experience with Vespa has uh, has turned him into the Bond that we now know. No. Yeah, I was thinking that too, and I, something I read when I was prepping for this where they said that, like, the studios, since, they, since Brosnan wasn't doing it anymore and they needed to find a new Bond, apparently it took them years to, you know, casting, trying to cast a new Bond before they settled on Craig. And I guess the studios wanted to kind of reboot it. So they went back to the original book. They wanted to do the original story of Bond and they wanted to show you how he got his double O <clears throat> number yeah. and like all that. And they wanted to show, like you said, that kind of darker kind of, you know, these people like to be a spy. I mean, take something from you. Like, yeah. The brutality. Which I think they... Yeah. I feel like they instantly lose that with the next Craig film. Then they just sort of become action <laughs> films from that on. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. I got I to gotta pee real quick. Yeah, go, go then, for it. Uh, come back here. Because I, I, I got a lot of notes on the movie, too. Yeah. <laughs> a lot nice. to talk about. Yeah. Give me like five seconds here. I've had a lot of fucking coffee. <laughs> As I have even more. But yeah, like this was Craig. And I remember I, I started the phrase and I named the, the chat this when we were starting the Blonde Bond. Yes. The first blonde boy, blonde haired, blue eyed boy as Bond. How was that? Because I remember reading articles when they were casting this, like in the early 2000s, you know, like People Magazine or whatever. And like they're talking about how, oh, this, the new Bond, the new Bond. Um, blonde? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> he, he doesn't look blonde, though. I swear. You watch it. He does, I don't, to me, I don't think he looks blonde. It looks like brown hair. Um, yeah, I am. Um, 
I think yeah, because Pierce Brosnan had, had you know I think Goldeneye I think is fantastic the first the first Pierce Brosnan film, and I think Tomorrow Never Dies has got uh, some good moments, but then World Is Not Enough and Die Another Day were just they were very bad films. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, it was definitely in need of a of, of a reboot. Um, and yeah, have you have you seen um, have you seen Layer Cake the the film? So that's the film that Daniel Craig was in a, a couple of years beforehand, and you can totally see that that was the film. <laughs> Somebody watching it sort of said, ah, he's Bond. Because there's a scene where he has to sneak into somebody's house wearing a black turtleneck with a silenced pistol. And he's sort of you know, with his back against the wall. And it, it just instantly, you think, oh, yeah, no, he, he's Bond. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and, yeah, I think he is he is the best part about about the film, for, for sure. And, uh, yeah, he's a convincing, convincing Bond. And there is, like, that demeanor, too. Like, yeah, like, how do you capture that demeanor? of the serious but also he's you know enjoys good meals he enjoys fine things and women and, and all these finer things of life but he's also like this not necessarily cold-blooded but he is when he has to be yeah it's um yeah it focuses it focuses nicely on 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 bond i think but despite it being you know filled with a few superfluous action scenes <laughs> <laughs> you know, it fundamentally is it, it's one of the few bond films that feels like it's mainly about bond rather rather than about the mission and uh and mads mickelson's good in it as well i guess <laughs> that's that's interesting yeah that it focuses because it does like i was going to ask too because they have that whole like black and white opening kind of cold open mm. in this one where they're showing him what he he verbalizes it in the novel at kind of at the end where he's telling Vesper, I think, right? How he or no, oh, he this. killed two people, yeah, yeah. How he got his double O uh, number for the uh, the agency, and he's kind of lamenting about it. But in this one, they just show you that, which I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, you got to do something when you're adapting a movie. But I didn't know how. Did, how did you feel like showing this kind of double O seven? How it came to be. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's good. And again, it's a it's a strong opening because it's much more brutal than than what you've seen. You know, it's much more brutal than any of the violence in Dine of the Day as to freeze the fight they have in the in the the bathroom. And yes. it's, it's yeah, yeah. It, um, yeah. You you get the sense that those kills are kind of meaningful both to the plot and to Bond. It doesn't feel like Bond shooting two henchmen on a you know on an oil rig. It's uh, yeah, it, it's an actual it's two actual murders of people. And that kind of like how it almost didn't work too. Like when, especially that bathroom one, cause the, the, the other one is he's sitting in the office and he's like, you know, the kind of classic spy he's broken mm. in and is sitting in the dark and he's already found like all the weapons that the person keeps in yes. their office and he's disarmed them. And he's just kind of waiting for them to come and that, that bathroom scene, you know, he's fighting for his life, basically <laughs> like his tuxedos ripped off, you know, like he's his yeah. shirt, the sinks are broken. There's water spraying everywhere. Like these guys are literally fighting to the death. And like you said, they show it. They show that brutality of two men. Basically, whoever wins is going to die, is, is going to live, you know, like. Yeah. Nobody, not two people can live at the end of this. And it is kind of right away. And the fact that they did it in black and white, I mean, because this, who is this director? Was, um... Is it Sam Mendes, this one? Let me check. No, it's Martin Campbell, uh, who also did, who also did Goldeneye. And he also did um, a great miniseries called Edge of Darkness in the '80s, which was a, like a sort of spy, spy with a touch of science fiction, uh, sort of political thriller on British TV. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's well directed. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then of course there's all like these little kind of like changes like small things and you know you 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 get creative license like i don't, I don't want to be like that type of person that's like pushing up the glasses like oh it's not like Ooh. the novel therefore it's bad but like i uh you know the little tiny changes where they did that inhaler that le Chiff, uh oh yeah you, they change it in the movie to like an oral inhaler inhaler instead of that oh and uh, it's a nasal like, one in like, the yeah or it's almost like they describe like like poppers or something. <laughs> this guy's like doing yeah. like poppers at the at the card table, like he's like snit or coke or something. You know, like. Uh... Well, I think so. The inhalers back then were they were a bit more potent than inhalers now. I think so. I think it is like speed that he's taking in the novel, <laughs> like sort of ben, Benzo's sort of thing. But um, yeah, it uh, it's just it's just an inhaler like the like the sickly kid would have in your glass and the. 
in the film. That's what I was thinking, and I was thinking... It's the Mill House in Hagen. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. The Mill House. Right. And I was thinking that, I was like, okay, I get, you know, you take it. I was like, why did they do that? I guess to make it so that people understood it was an inhaler, maybe. But it does kind of make him, and like you said, it was already kind of like, he's kind of a weaker villain anyway compared to other Bond villains. Mm -hmm. But, like, I was like, what? This guy's hitting an inhaler like he's got a fucking asthma attack or something at the table. It's like, <laughs> it does kind of make him a little less sinister than the nasal inhaler. Like, if he was yeah, doing that up the nasal nose. inhaler would be a bit more, um, it'd be a bit more like, like Blue Velvet, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah. That's what I was <laughs> yeah. thinking. Yeah. I did. I thought exactly the same thing Blue Velvet with the fucking oxygen, <laughs> like huffing oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I was thinking that. I was like, huh? Strange choice, whatever. It doesn't make or break the movie, but I was just like, uh, I don't know if I would have done that. Uh, Did you think if if Ian Fleming had known about parkour, he would have put a parkour chase in the book? <laughs> it's only <laughs> it's only the lack of its his knowledge of it that meant that he didn't. <laughs> That's, that is a very long parkour scene in that film. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that because of the because the first hour of the of the movie really is 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 a dramatized action that isn't in the novel, you know. Yeah, because there's the parkour scene and there's the airport thing, right? It's so like a huge shootout. Yeah, where he's breaking yeah. the embassy in Uganda or something, and uh, uh, yeah. very spy. Like you said, I think that was because. At this point, it had been, you know, 60, 50 years since they had been making Bond movies and they needed to include that, like you said, huge action sequences, almost comical in some sense. But yeah, and as, as, as funny as the parkour thing is, it is it is at least physical and stunt based compared to uh, like an invisible car that you had in the previous film or him surfing uh, down a, a, a waterfall and stuff like that you had in the previous. It's, you know, it is him getting bashed around personally <laughs> i did think the, the part that made me laugh out loud was when he's chasing that guy in the embassy and he bursts through the drywall oh, yeah. like i literally laughed out loud i was like i have to bring this Rook up a moment. <laughs> yeah was, and it was almost kind of there was it was it almost went into like joking comedy mm. at that point but like it didn't go full fully into that but i was kind of like <laughs> I gotta bring this up to Nanny when we talk, man. Because like, I, gotta... <laughs> I was, and I see why they added that. Like, I see why you know, if you're making a huge, big budget, big budget blockbuster that you want to make millions off of, you know, worldwide releases. I understand you gotta, you gotta give the goods kind of thing, give a big, big spectacle. But I, I didn't know how I felt about the hour long action sequences that, like, before we get to the plots of it. I just want your thoughts. How did you feel? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a huge action fan in general in, in, in terms of cinema. And obviously they're the first Bond films that are coming out after the Bourne films. And so they're very much taking that editing style of, like, super choppy. Like, you know, you, in all those films, you barely see Bond connect a punch in a single shot. Like, you know, you have a shot of his fist and then it'll cut to the enemy's face and then it'll cut to another shot of his fist and then it'll cut to a long shot, you know, everything's hyper edited and that that just my head in a bit i remember in the cinema finding the car chase a bit like um although the car crash at the end of the chase is fantastic there's a, so many flips over right the, yeah the, um but yeah i've never never been a huge action fan so yeah i remember in the cinema thinking oh can we get to the can we get to the backer again now yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was thinking that too because because the first 30 40 minutes of it you're like oh cool whatever but then like there's like a 20 minute almost lull before we get there where it's like oh is it mm. still going on he's chasing this guy what the fuck's this guy in uganda have to do with anything like kind of uh but when you brought up the born stuff i thought i didn't even think about that like the kind of paul greengrass the innovations that happened right there with the kind of the fight we're just shaking the camera you know like the the hand yeah held, and that was the fight scene so you couldn't even focus it was so disorienting watching some of that i didn't even think about that in terms of the trends that's yeah it's sort of it's it's a feed it's a feedback loop isn't it because obviously born doesn't exist without the bond yeah. franchise but then but then born becomes massively successful and so all the sort of stylistic elements of of that and of things like 24 and, and that could get kind of looped back into into james bond it becomes you know it's taking its children's ideas. And I'm always fascinated by that. Like I want to do an episode eventually on Bloom's uh, The Anxiety of Influence, 
where mm-hmm. like you can't avoid this kind of because this movie, even though it was the first Bond novel, like you said, it had already been influenced by like twenty other Bond films that came before it, like all the other spy movies that came before it, the Bournes, the Mission Impossibles, you know, and then that's just the nineties stuff, early two thousands stuff. I mean, all the spy shit that was inspired by Bond and then pushed the boundaries and then you have to yeah, I mean, it is interesting how that happens, and, and it's really unavoidable. It's almost like an osmosis kind of. You're absorbing all these things around you, and then it comes out in these weird ways. But yeah, that, that's yeah. fucking interesting, man, yeah. The dynamic between Vesper and Bond in the movie version, what, what did you think? I think one thing they do in the Daniel Craig Bonds, which they, they didn't certainly didn't do in the Roger Moore era... Is they generally give him sort of age appropriate Bond girls. It's like it's not like by the time you get to some of those later Roger Moore's, like Fury Eyes Only, you've got like a, a nineteen year old Bond girl, and you've got <laughs> and you've got Roger Moore at that point pushing sixty years old, and his like liver spotted hand caressing this like this beautiful <laughs> young girl's face. And I think like with with Daniel Craig, they always match him up with. I don't know what the what the age difference is between him and Eva Green, but they they seem you know at least in the film they seem about the same age, and it sort of it, it does she does feel like a you know it it does feel like somebody Bond would 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 fall for rather than just want to sleep with. Like you can see that you know she's she's sort of what what he would he would want. And I think yeah, but well, she's she's fantastic as a, as an actress. Yeah, yeah. My and then that first scene, I guess, like I was thinking, because you have that big hour long kind of you know the backstory in the beginning, and then like he's getting where they're setting up why they're like, I, I do think the writers and the directors were trying to set up why Bond and MI6 and the CIA and everybody was, was trying to bankrupt this you know terrorist organization through a card game, so they're setting up that and like they're kind of trying to set up the villains' financial woes too. So I get all that, but I just remember seeing that first scene with him and Vesper, and I was like, this is, it, it bordered on cringe watching it now. Like, they're, they're kind of back and forth at that dinner, that train car or whatever that they're uh, they're having dinner on. and uh, mm, Yeah. It's like a weird, like, early 2000s psychoanalysis back and forth where they, like, <laughs> profile yeah. each other. Also, so. also marred by the sort of weird product placement thing that she has to sort of mention that he's got an Omega watch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was an Oxford I think man. As, yeah. I think as well the 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 suicide of her at the at the end is you know it feels less um, because it's more of an action packed way for her to die, isn't it? it? It it feels in a way less emotionally impactful. The fact that in the book it's just happening happens off page. It, you know, Bon Bon wakes up and she's already already died. This you know compared to him diving into a Venice building. <laughs> I did, and that's what I was thinking. That's why I was kind of they 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 set it up, and I, and I wonder why. I mean, obviously they were trying to change it up a little bit, right? But it, it does kind of show this kind of almost adversarial relationship between Vesper and Bond at first in the movie, because mm-hmm. in the book, you know, I think they kind of show Vesper as being intimidated. She's trying to prove herself, you know, this double O yeah. agent, and here. Um, not not that they tried to make her like overly tough or anything, but like. Uh, it was almost adversarial where like she was getting flustered with bond, you know, that kind of, um, mm. I mean, it's subtle, but I think it does like you were getting at, like, I think it does change Vesper's character a little bit. And then it does change the tragedy at the end there where her death a little bit, because she's, I don't know, I guess these two spies that didn't really want to work together. And I get it. You know, it kind of adds like a quirky kind of, it changes it up a little bit. I think if mm-hmm. I were going to say why they tried to do it, I'd be like, all right, well, they were trying to freshen it up, right? This is like an, an old conversation from the fifties. They were trying to change up the sex dynamics. They were trying to change up, you know, make it fresh, make it for today. You know, they were setting it in 2006 present day at the time, but yeah, there is a weird kind of less sympathetic angle to it i mean i don't know i'm just this is what i picked watching it you know stoned late at night <laughs> before we recorded this yeah, but, yeah. i think it's a it, it's a modern way of you know and also a very cinematic way of doing it is that i think a lot of people for you you can't show a character being attracted to another character particularly a female character being attracted to a male character without that seeming like an act of submission like, and I think so. She, you know, I think it, that's why there's that, that she is more aloof and she is more. I think if she was instantly attracted to him, 
I think for a lot of audience members, that would instantly make her a less serious character, which I think right. which says more about the audience members than it does <laughs> about her. But I think there is that thing that in you know, in order to take a female spy character seriously, um, you, you people want her to be a female version of James Bond rather than she's quite a different character in, in, in the book. She's not like she is quite infatuated with him almost. You can tell during the, the scene where they're getting the, the champagne and the caviar and stuff that she's, you know, she's really into him. Um, but yeah, she's a little bit more aloof in the, the film, but that just sort of always seems to be how it goes. Yeah. Like, and yeah, you know, I don't want to be that guy that's like, well, the novel, it was like, yeah. Cause you know, mm. you're allowed to change shit up. You know, you're allowed, if you're adapting something, you, yeah, you can change it up. But like, yeah, that was something that, and like you said, it did affect the ending a little bit with the, uh, with him discovering her dead or the suicide or whatever. But yeah, same thing with the villain. And we we talked a little bit where they kind of early on they they kind of make the the villain a little weaker in the movie, even weaker than we see him in the novel. Where like they have that like Ugandan guy like come to him and like hold the gun on him in the middle of that like break in the game you know and bond kills them and hides the bodies um it almost seems like the you know the shifts uh clients tend to like they're like depicted as more villainous than he is or it's one of the few bond stories where the villain doesn't have a master plan the bond that's got a master plan is mi6 that has a master plan um it's not that Bond is uncovering a, a, a plan. It's the villain is uncovering Bond's plan to, 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 to take him out. And so that sort of instantly makes the villain a bit more of a defensive character. And it's not like the villain isn't really one step ahead of Bond. Bond's one step ahead of him most of the, the time. Um, which is, yeah, it's a different way of doing it. But it does mean that it doesn't quite, doesn't quite have the impact of a villain as, as you know somebody like Blofeld might have. Yeah, and I noticed that with uh, with that hour long edition, basic because if they did this the straight novel, this would be like a ninety minute thriller movie, like not really yeah. like the big action packed you know two hour blockbuster that they were going for. But like <clears throat> when they have Bond sleep with that that one like drug lord's wife or something, or like like, um, and then they they do try to show that like that was Le Chief, uh getting information or whatever from that mm. woman because bond was a little loose lips when he was having sex with her or whatever and so they do try to imply that like he was like in the novel where like he knows more than bond does or bonds underestimating him and that's yeah. the downfall for a lot of their plans that they've been trying to do so i don't know i just thought something like that but uh yeah i mean it, it was this kind of I, I I don't know why I, I blur they blurred together in my head. I kept thinking like you know the Javier Bardem uh, villain. That's the later movie, right? Is that Quantum of Solace? Is that? Uh... Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Which I haven't seen since I saw it in the cinema. I really didn't like Quantum of Solace. Yeah, <laughs> it was weird. It was like it didn't make sense, and then like his face was gone or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I tried I to forget know. that. I think. <laughs> they always get like these Oscar winners to like play the villains and shit in these movies now. And if they're like, they're either hit or miss too. Like they're just like picking different, o- like the Rami, Rami Malik or, or yeah. what, uh, just did that the recent one. That's what I mean. I'm not a huge Bond guy, so I need somebody who is. Uh, when I was doing this, I was like, yeah, I need somebody who uh, knows this better than <laughs> I do. So you've been, you've been working your way through the Bond books that you say you've done the first four. I did the first four and I was doing that just for like, you know, because I was like, Hey, I like this. This is a classic thing. And I'm really into the pulp stuff and I had never actually read the books. So I was like, I want to do this. So I started building them out and I guess like I, they were all part of that 2012 one with the kind of 007 graphics like this. Yeah. They all kind of look like this. Um, and I got to the fourth one here and then on Amazon, you and I were chatting about this where, uh, all of a sudden they were all unavailable. And then, like a couple of yeah. months later, they made the announcement that they're whitewashing all of these, and then you're going to only find these ones at like used bookstores now. So I and did I have a know, damper they, on that. Are the publishing rights owned by Amazon now? Because I know Amazon's bought the film rights. I don't know if the publishing rights are also. I don't know if they own Bond outright, but they've. Yeah, they they now own all the Bond films and the Bond film license. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if listeners out there know. Write it in, but like I. 
I know because that's what happened with Doll, right? Like the 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 estate was sold to like Netflix or a huge conglomerate, so then Netflix owns the estate or something now, or their parent company yeah. does or something, and like so now they can do whatever they want. I don't know because I know Fleming, he did have it set up with like his own estate and all that, but you know when the family's falling hard times, <laughs> they got to sell off that estate or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now that he's dead, I don't know. Are you trying to look it up? Yeah. Uh, I can I can look it up, yeah. Because uh, I wonder if they also own Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which he wrote. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Talk about classics. Yeah. Which, you know, it's a car full of gadgets when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, I, that's interesting, too, with the Fleming listeners, where there's, like, he was he talks about bond doing this in a lot of the books too where they talk about like this the the devices that the different intelligence agencies and militaries were trying to develop everywhere from russia to the uk to the us to like you know all these different places that were you know basically against the communist you know, the cold war but the two sides of it were all trying to develop these weapons that could be used to spy this you know dampen sound uh kill people without traces like the cane in the book that they don't use in the movie like the uh yes. gun cane that they sneak into the casino and, and put a you know bonds back or whatever to threaten him uh so i found it that amazon haven't haven't bought this it's ian fleming publications limited which owns the rights to the author's work has employed sensitivity readers to look at the text and make recommendations for changes the changes include the removal of the n-word in almost all cases <laughs> <laughs> I want to know which ones they thought well no that's that's too essential to the plot that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and they've added a disclaimer to the books that says this book was written at a time when terms and attitudes which might be considered offensive by modern readers were commonplace <laughs> a number of updates have been made in this edition while keeping it as close to as possible to the original text and the period in which it is set is it is it diamonds or forever the one that has like a lot of the n-word or like the one where they're uh, like in Africa. Yes, there's quite a bit of it in that, and there's a fair bit of it in Live and Let Die as well. It also says they just, in general, removed references to the ethnicity of a number of minor characters. So I guess, like you know, when he's talking about you know, what what ethnicity the waiter was or the the bellboy or whatever, that's been excised. Right, because that one is in is in like the Caribbean, right? Like that one that. Uh... Uh, yeah, Doc, some of Doctor No is in the Caribbean, and some of Live and Let Die is as well. And in this one, they try to make, like, I guess they kind of take out the Jamaica angle in the movie for Casino Royale, but like where he's supposed to be like mm. some playboy from Jamaica or whatever. That's like, his oh, cover. yes, that's his cover story. Yeah. They show him going to the Bahamas, but not Jamaica in like the movie, but which, you know, whatever, like a different kind of Caribbean island mm. or something. But yeah, that's interesting. I am curious. And I mean, you and I have chatted about this. I've been posting about it. You've been posting about it. Everybody that's fucking been posting about it with this, like, I keep asking myself, why are they doing this? You know, like, why are they trying to change these words? Why are they trying to, like I said, uh, appeal to sensitivities with these sensitivity readers and things like that? And I know the arguments that a lot of people make are saying, oh, well, they're just trying to sell books because they're not selling as well. as I doubt they're not selling as well. I mean, I'm sure they're not selling as well as they did 30 years ago, like all books, but... I'm like, are they really like the Roald Dahl stuff? You know, the, are they, so those books really not selling? Like you thought you had to like, you know, chop them so, up. So, you know, I'm I'm against all of it. I see the argument more with the Roald Dahl one, and I can imagine some parents reading them to their children and 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 grimacing a little bit at some of the descriptions in in there. And yeah, you know, not that I think they should remove them, but I kind of get the business case there. But if somebody is picking up Diamonds Are Forever in 2023. You know, that like we've already said, like, you know, lots of people are so dismissive as for Bond for being sexist, for being sort of imperialist. Or I think, like, if you kind of go into the book, you, you surely know that already. And I can't imagine that the odd ethnic descriptor would, would make somebody think, well, I'm never reading another Bond book again. Because I don't think those people would have picked up a Bond book in the first place. Um, that's the interesting yeah. part. Yeah. Is that, is that nobody reads anymore. There's like a very tiny yeah. percentage of the p- of population that reads and they're trying to save us from like seeing like outdated terms or like a racist, what we would consider a racist description of something like a unfairly racist kind of portrayal or something. And as you say, it's whitewashing. It's pretending that it's pretending that the past had the same supposedly perfect morals that the present has. It's, it's sort of, 
yeah, it's pretending that people never did use, you know, derogatory terms or, or, or you know, or blunt descriptors of, of, of people. It's, uh, yeah, it's so it's so odd. And you Especially think if they're doing people... it to... No, sorry. Yeah, I was if they're doing it to Bond, they'll do it for everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially when you think of like, well, how old is Bond supposed to be in this? Like, I know we never really get his age, but he's supposed to be like 30, 40s, right? 30s, 40s. Yeah, like I think that. probably late 30s. Yeah. Like that, like in the 50s. Like, so this person was literally growing up. Like, <laughs> he would have grown up. Like, and especially in like the America, like the segregated America. Like, that's where he grew up, like, kind of thing. Fleming, like all these guys, like they grew up in this era, like it was just normal, like, and like you said, it is kind of a, a disservice to the history if we're actually trying to acknowledge what happened and how we overcame it or something, or the, you know, to to say that oh, this is just the way it always was. It is yeah. Soviet, like it is Soviet in that way. Where, Absolutely, like, yeah. yeah, and they'll they'll come for the films as well. It won't just be the books. It'll be you know, particularly with the rise of the AI and stuff. It'll be so easy to to replace a character or to remove a cigarette from someone's hand or you know all these. Lot I think you know there's gonna be lots of little changes that will creep in to to the films as well as the books. I was gonna say that too. They they took the cigarettes out. When did the cigarettes stuck? Because I was thinking back, I don't remember Pierce Brosnan smoking much in those nineties movies either, but I could just I haven't seen him in a while, so like when did they stop Ooh, having Bond pull out those cigarettes when he was Ah, yeah, that's interesting. When did the I'm it would hmm. make sense if it was in the nineties because that was like the big tobacco wars, at least in the US yeah. and shit. But in Dine of the Day he's puffing away on a cigar when he's in Cuba, for right, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's weird how cigars are allowed. Like it's even in the U.S., there's all these taxes and shit on cigarettes and stuff because they're trying to like make people not smoke. But cigars are always ex exempt. Like, <laughs> and it's I think it's because all the politicians <laughs> like smoke them and shit, so they yeah. don't want to have them banned and like taxed. You can still it order looked... those online. You can't order cigarettes oh, or vape wow, online, really? but you can order and, cigars. Can you advertise cigars as well? Uh, I don't think you can do it on TV or billboards like tobacco, but you can like if you go to the websites, you can order cigars in the mail, and but you can't do any other tobacco products. But you can do cigars and pipe tobacco and very oh, interesting very strange because they say in the opening chapter of, of casino he, he lights his 70th cigarette of the day right yeah in the casino. <laughs> the chain like, think about how yellow bond's fingers must be <laughs> the <laughs> interiors of the walls yeah like yeah the one who like heavy indoors my grandmother you know everybody of that generation my grandparents were smokers and like my grandmother's house was just yellow like you know like yeah. all the walls were just like yellow and like it reeked and like Everybody. Have you got to um? Have you got to Thunderball yet? Have you read I that one? No, I haven't. Because uh, there's a the, the the beginning of Thunderball is is Bond checking into a health spa, and so as part of that, they sort of give you a rundown of what his lifestyle is like and what his eating and drinking habits are and stuff. And yeah, it does not paint a healthy picture. <laughs> uh, they don't they do that in uh one of the Brosnan james bonds where he's like going under a medical eval and they're like oh his liver is shot to shit like <laughs> he must be yeah, doing that yes. to himself like <laughs> kind of thing but again i don't think i remember him ever pulling out a cigarette or maybe i'm just well i'll have to check that as because it is so done. important to it it's important to the atmosphere it's important to the like you said if they were to do it as like a period piece you know you have to include that like a score yeah you have to or, absolutely yeah, yeah. Where it was just everybody was doing it all the time in every room, every building. Like you didn't ask permission to smoke in somebody's house. You just like, I yeah. Know, my grandparents used to do that. So if we rented like a beach house every year, and when my grandparents were still alive, we would go down and you know go to the ocean every summer or whatever for a week in a beach house. And it was a non-smoking house. My grandmother would just set up an ashtray like in the kitchen and just be like <laughs> smoking. And her friends would come over and she would just be yeah smoke like smoke in this non-smoking house or whatever Brilliant. until the day she died. Yeah, like, just like yeah, and it was just part of it. The drinking, yeah, all of that. So it was very fifties. Like it was. Like you said, it was a fantasy. It was kind of this indulgent stuff. Like, uh, and I don't know enough about the U.S. side of it in terms of the rationing. I don't know how long that lasted, but I guess the U.S. Yeah. it was spared most of the destruction that all of Europe had during the war. So I don't know if they had to ration as long. So everybody in the U.S. was enjoying indulgent shit at that point. Yes, I'm not sure. Yeah, because certainly 
I've got I've got a copy of a cookbook from um from the late fifties British cookbook, and it's just the it's the bleakest thing you've ever seen <laughs> compared, <laughs> compared to what Fleming's talking about. It's like you know it's just like lumps of peas and ham in gelatin <laughs> with like a bunch of prawns and mayonnaise around it. Like there's you know there's no caviar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said my only experience with with the English cuisine is uh, uh I went to England with my family when I was young, probably like two thousand three ish. So I was like you know thirteen if that i barely remember most of it and then i just have gordon ramsay restaurants here in vegas <laughs> like gordon ramsay's like british like dishes or whatever and i'm like they're really good what's everybody talking about <laughs> the mushy peas they're pretty good <laughs> yeah that's crazy if you're hearing this it's because you are listening to the free public feed of heavy board to get complete uncensored uninterrupted full access to this podcast become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board that's right heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you for less than one cup of coffee per month you will receive private access to uncensored full-length episodes jerk shop heavy bonus content subscribers only ama episodes bonus extended interviews and more come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board it's almost crazy to think too like how it wasn't even that long ago it wasn't even that fucking long ago and we're already starting to whitewash that piece of it like we're starting to like try and take things We're trying to, I think it is, they're trying to denigrate it in some way. And I know it's like, oh, a vague they or whatever, because it is this kind of a cultural milieu, right? But like Mm -hmm. people, they're trying to take it down a notch. I think like they're trying to tell you this is bad and you shouldn't like it. And, you know, like they're trying to defame the legacy, deface it in some way, you know. At least, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, whether it's deliberate or whether it's just that there's now a, 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 a class of people making these decisions who don't value art, who don't value it as anything more than um, product, as, you know. And so if you can shave some of the edges off the product, then you can sell it to a slightly younger audience or you can, you know, then I, I think like um, there's, yeah, people people don't always have the the best intentions and, and but sometimes or they, or they or they have good intentions but they don't care about they don't care that it's art or literature it's just uh it's just a product in the same way that you know i don't know anything about baseball cards so if you put me in charge of the baseball card business i'd probably make a lot of decisions that pissed off people that were really into baseball cards because i don't know what's sacred i don't know what they look for and i think there's probably a lot of people in in publishing houses and film studios and stuff who who don't have that appreciation for 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 it as as anything more than product and so and there's like an embarrassment to it there's like they're like apologizing for it or something like they're like i mean and again it's hard to pinpoint because it is just kind of this atmosphere of a bunch of different shit that's making people do this so and you know i don't think we're gonna get an answer listeners but i'm just like it does feel like there is this kind of I've been talking about this a lot. Like there feels like there's this kind of death attitude around literature and art, like all the time. And I don't know if I'm just doom scrolling, you know, like on Twitter or whatever, but it does feel like there's this kind of like lament for the fact that these arts even existed or something. They're like, Oh, well that was a different time. It was bad. That kind of thing. And I'm like, what, like, what are we doing? Yeah. It's yeah. Just as sort of, like as if the acceptable position is to be like, well, you shouldn't care about it because it's because it's just it's just film, it's just TV and stuff like. That. Well, you obviously care enough about it to edit it. You obviously think it's powerful enough as a, as a, uh, to be worth censoring. So I should think it's powerful enough to to, to not censor. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's and it is kind of this. Yeah, like we're we're one. I think it's this weird paradox of we're pretending it has more power than it does while also knowing that it actually does have a lot of cultural impact. Like, yeah. like it's like this. Teams... While also making it seem like anyone that has a problem with editing it is somehow a loser for caring about what they're doing with the, you know, well, why'd you care what they're doing with the children? Right. But why'd you care what they're doing with James Bond book? It's, um, yeah, nothing sacred. <laughs> well, even that, like, they say, like, why do you care? It's like, oh, cause I fucking care about like, like the history of this. Like I care about preserving this stuff because 
not only that, this goes back to what we said in the very beginning, like Bond is a cultural icon and he's a cultural icon through not just in British culture, like it's American, it's you, it's all mm-hmm. over the fucking world. Like people like all over the world know who this guy is and what, you know, the, the, the kind of atmosphere around him is like, it is the spy archetype basically now Like he's become that like, and just, yeah. just, just brush that off to pretend that we can make it different all of a sudden or something. It's like, <clears throat> Yeah, and it's crazy. once you, once you open the floodgates as well it's like well once you've done it once once you've taken out a couple of words it's like well in five years time we know will we just be taking out all the cigarettes from it as well we look from all from the books so we'll be taking out you know taking out any of the sex scenes and stuff like what what there's it's always gonna be something that you, you'll find you know once you start editing it there's no end to that there's no edge to that especially with like it's like yeah if you're a true believer if you believe that you're saving the world by editing these books whitewashing them of offensive material offensive words or whatever like you know like it's really kind of an absurd position to hold like if you believe that we're going to change the world through censoring old books from an old time i don't, I don't know a, how you square a, it yeah it's a squarely ahistorical as well isn't it because it's it's a belief that the present moment is um is the final moment that we've 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 reached it we've decided this is this is how we feel about women this is how we feel about race this is how we feel about you know smoking this everything is is right here in 2023 you know from people who in three years time will be happy to to shift all of those goalposts but we have to pretend when we're talking to them that no they they totally believe it they totally believe that now is the time now is where we've got it all right we all worked it all out (laughs) Just, right. just this year, we just got it. We just got it all in place, and now we can start making edits. It is a hubris, yeah. It's like a hubris on that, like, mm-hmm. yeah. I say smoking, yeah. They're gonna come for that. They already are. Like, I noticed this just a couple years ago, like on like Netflix stuff. When you're watching something, it'll say rated this for smoking, like rated, you know, TVMA yeah. for smoking and foul language, nudity, and then it has smoking. I'm like, smoking is a. <laughs> <laughs> it's like now like an r-rated or a pg-13 rating for smoking like holy crap like yeah are brits as anti-smoking as americans um oh he's into smoking um not hugely i mean lots of people don't like smoke um but yeah i mean I, would, have you is it national the smoking ban over there or is it state by state different places the... state by state because no, we've basically had yeah. no smoking indoors since about 2007 anyway yeah, that's when like any any restaurant yeah, yeah. Um, i remember there was one of the things i remember because i was a kid going over to the uk and we we went to you know we went to london obviously as a family and then we went to glasgow and there were some other areas, like mm-hmm. cool uh, edinburgh like cool uh you know historical areas you want to see the castles you want to see all the cool shit over there and like you know that was fun or my parents you know and my parents are non-smokers uh, listeners they had never smoked in their life kind of thing uh and they were disappointed when i started and it was like this kind of uh <laughs> uh they, they kept complaining the whole time because the u.s at that time like 2003 was just at the end of this kind of tobacco wars of the 90s where they had banned yeah. it everywhere but that hadn't reached the uk yet so you could still be people just smoking in the airports and stuff and my parents would be like oh my god you know like oh it smells like <laughs> and i'd just be like what what what's all that's cool like <laughs> <laughs> But I guess it catches up with everybody, yeah. So now it's yeah. no indoor, no indoor smoking anywhere. Man, it was, that wasn't long ago either. Like you could no, still. And when I lived in Louisiana, like I grew up in Maryland here in the U in the states, and it was like right around that time, no smoking anywhere indoors. They called what they called the Clean Indoor Air Act of like 2007 and shit. And they would even the smoking sections you couldn't even have smoking sections anymore. Mm anywhere the only exception i think in the states right now is like casinos and even a lot of the casinos there's sections not in vegas here but like there's a lot of the other ones there's like oh this is the smoking section of the casino and they don't have all the games here and you can't you Mm. know type thing but you know vegas it's just smoke everywhere kind of thing but when i lived in louisiana you could still smoke it was like place by place some of the places would have no smoking but then like it wasn't a statewide or countywide or ban or something like that then now it's like an R. It's like a fucking giving you a PG thirteen rating. Like that's <laughs> yeah. gonna just make kids want to do it more. Like Jesus, if you're making yeah, it taboo. Absolutely. And I think that didn't that something come out like it, it spiked or something? 
what t- tobacco? Well, I mean, vape usage is 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 increasing, isn't it? Um, I don't know about actual actual tobacco, but yeah, certainly is now. Yeah, that's so weird now that there's generations of people who who who've never smoked but who do vape. It, like there's something that's originally sold as a as a um, as a way to help you quit now just becomes a new addiction for a new marketplace of people who've never never cared about tobacco, but now they they're addicted to vaping. It's getting even weirder with those pouches. And now you're seeing it online a lot. I'm sure you're seeing this too with like like people that are just like, oh yeah, I, I just do Zen pouches. And I'm like, like, oh yeah, everyone at the office where I work is, is doing those. Oh, well, I tried them once. It's horrible. Yeah, yeah. like when you're, when you're somebody who started smoking and you're trying to go to vaping or the pouches to stop, you know, like that, like it, it's always yeah. not as good. Like you're just kind of like, oh my God, like. Nothing, nothing hates right, the exactly. same. Exactly, it's one of the few pleasures on earth, and now we're giving PG thirteen ratings for it. Like it's like seeing a pair of tits <laughs> yeah. or something. Like, yeah. yeah, fucking crazy, dude. <laughs> this is like this is yeah, listeners. This is a PSA. Start smoking. No, no. <laughs> Stop smoking seventy yeah, cigarettes 70. a day, like but like James Bond. Oh <laughs> yeah. I mean, and everybody who smokes and you gamble, you know, if you're in a casino, especially those ones where, like nowadays where they're like, pumping oxygen into the fucking room. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, you're getting yeah. high off of it. Like as you're doing, you're just like puffing, puffing away. You can just go through packs of cigarettes sitting at the table, yeah. getting stoned. Yeah, it's fucking yeah. great. Uh, one of my questions, one of, I have a couple final questions here. I'm just like book versus yep. movie type shit. Uh does the movie and you know what do you think on this does the movie capture the spirit of the book and like the spirit of bond and all that uh yeah i think i i don't think it's brilliant as a film but yeah i think it's um in terms of what they were trying to do with the film of trying to trying to take it back to the beginning and try and reset it and try and make bond serious again i think it i think it succeeds pretty well i think as a, as a straight adaptation of the book it feels a bit bloated almost like the book is so snappy as you, as you said it's only a few scenes really but yeah adding adding the parkour chase and the airport stuff it just yeah it, it sort of slows it down a bit but the, um, the defibrillator i guess we didn't even talk about that like the oh yeah it's uh again it's just it, it, him leaving the casino is the main problem with that it's just like it just breaks up the action and you know it's funny as i, I wouldn't have noticed this if i wasn't re-watching the mission impossible ones mission mm. impossible 3 which came out the same year 2006 ish right they have a scene with that where they're putting chips in the brain or whatever to kill them now and like mm-hmm. they have to like kill themselves to like short circuit it with like a defibrillator and then bring themselves back it's like a plot line in the mission impossible 3 ones. Oh, okay so i wonder if they added that in there because it was just like a thing that was happening like at the time yeah. like just like well he's gotta he's gotta die and then bring himself back with this defibrillator yeah. like that they keep in his glove box. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, I would say too, I think, I think it did it, it, that spirit. And I, and I get why, you know, you always see those hardcore fans of certain, any type of IP when a movie is made, you know, the fans are pissed. What they're really pissed about is this, like the spirit of it. Did it capture the essence, that thing that's so hard to actually mm. portray and, and keep right? Like, and that's hard to do. So I, I have sympathy for filmmakers and writers that are trying to do that on the screen. I think they're genuinely trying, but you know, it doesn't always work. So it is always nice to see when you can at least, even if like you said, the, you don't think the movie's that good, you can look at somebody like Craig and be like, you know, I think Craig gave it his all, man. Like he yeah, really absolutely. did like try to do all this stuff. And yeah, so I think it does too. Like there's kind of the spirit, even if there is a little bloat to it, I think that's a good word for it. Uh, book or movie better if you had to pick. I think book in this in, for this one, yeah. It's not. I don't think that's. I don't think that's true of every Bond book. I think there's definitely some films with them that, that are superior to the, the books. But yeah, with this one, I think think book over over movie. Yeah, I would have to do the same. Like, and it's. I, I always try to avoid being a purist in that sense. Like, I, I'm not. But there is something to how fast that book reads, how clean mm. it is, how like you have how like seven scenes just sharp hit 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 here we go and like i reread it i reread it in like two days like two sittings or you know an hour of reading yeah. and you can read the whole book and it's still gives you that thrill even though it is just over a card game that was one that i couldn't believe i was like this yeah. Fleming managed to make this card game suspenseful like yeah i mean you can see why it was a hit you can see why i ended up writing another one like it it's um yeah it's punchy they all are too yeah but then, like, I mean, it very rarely is a movie better than a book. 
kind of mm, yeah. usually there are exceptions right there are rare exceptions and we, we get blown mm-hmm. away uh but yeah it's always it's always and bond's a weird one too because like there's so many book adaptations but then they have original storylines in the movies too yep. that like they just make fictional movies or you know new stories out of the same characters mm. Yeah, like I'd say, I'd say Goldeneye is one of the best Bond stories, and that's not, you know, it's not from a book. It's just, right. it's just the film story. But I think, it's, you know, in terms of a Bond story, it's it's one of the better ones. And yeah. like that, like the, everybody talks Goldeneye. You know, the, my first introduction, I played the video game on N sixty four before just, I saw the uh, movie. Like, because <laughs> yeah, I was just a ama- kid, amazing, you know? <laughs> life yeah. life changing. That. Yeah. <laughs> And that's like the culture, like it's bigger than just a novel or a series of novels. It's bigger than just these movies with, you know, a bunch of different actors that have played them over the years and stuff. It's video games, it's memorabilia, it's costumes, it's, you know, the... Did you ever play the the Mission Impossible N64 game? No, I didn't. That's, that's fantastic. And it's one of the first spy games to actually have you doing some spying you're not just shooting people there's a scene in it which is really i think influenced on the later hitman games where you just at an embassy party and you have to go and meet a contact get some poison from them go and get a drink put the poison in the drink give it to an ambassador follow him into the toilets when he's sick knock him out take his clothes put a mask on and then get back up the stairs of the embassy to the upper floors and stuff and you it's a proper it's a proper spy mission it's like you don't use a gun at all you just have to so and then the whole time you're doing it there's a cia agent that's trying to take you out so you have to make sure you're never in the same room alone with her and stuff. it's uh it's a real lost gem actually yeah that actually i sounds like it was probably went under the radar with uh yeah <laughs> with golden eye coming yeah. out or whatever with the yeah damn yeah, yeah. So... great that's fucking awesome dude yeah that's fucking yeah. awesome that was all I had, man. Did we miss anything? Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's covered. That's yeah, great to great to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, any uh, final thoughts or anything, Nanny? No, I think just uh if if you're someone who's in even slightly interested in the James Bond films, you should definitely read what read read some of the James Bond books. I think it's um I'm I'm always amazed by how many people I meet who say they're really big Bond fans and have never never read the books. So, uh, a friend introduced me to, to her boyfriend the other day and he was talking about how much you love James Bond and I was chatting about James Bond and then brought the books on it, never never read any of them. I said, oh, but, but, <laughs> you seem to love it. Um, so yeah, I think if you're know if you out there and you've seen a few Bond films and you like Bond, check out some of the books because it's not quite what you expect and you, um, yeah. And, and they're uh, not like the typical, like they're not like a Stephen King level like corniness either. They're very sharp. No. They're very clean. They're very... Like Hemingway inspired is what I always think right away. Like the, the mm. they're very, yeah, they're not what you think. They're not this kind of brash kind of. And like you said, even this Bond gets you get to see him broken in a lot of ways too. That you don't yeah. see him broken in a lot of those movies where he's just like the hero. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, movies. I don't think you want to be Bond by the end of this book. <laughs> you maybe do. You know, reading the first chapter, you think, oh, he seems cool. But I think, yeah, I don't think you. Many people would want to swap places with him by the time you get to the final page of uh, of Casino Royale. And I wonder if Fleming felt that too, being like kind of a mm. spy for during the. Well, I guess he was in World War Two too, too, wasn't he? Like he was. Yeah, he he had some plan to get uh, Alistair Crowley to pretend to defect. Alistair Crowley's a, a British magician, and to get him to. Uh, pretend to defect and then give false astrological readings to Hitler, which would be fed to him by the intelligence service, so that they would then influence Hitler because they knew Hitler was into oh. astrology. To to that they would feed these false astrological readings, but then in the end they did this thing called D-Day instead. Which apparently worked a lot better. <laughs> worked a lot better than, than Fleming's plan. <laughs> There's a theoretical alternate universe out there where they they decided to you know much as in Casino Royale they bank everything on the card playing ability but they would <laughs> they bank the entire war effort on 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 one sort of British opium addict's ability to. It's like this to is what like the intelligence like. agencies are all doing. Yeah. Like, like, just like, like well, what if we beat him at cards? Like that'll really yeah. get his yeah. ego. Like yeah, it'll yeah. break him. Like, <laughs> just do a Scrabble game. <laughs> Yeah, that's been yeah. fucking great. Well, Nanny State, this has been fucking awesome. Uh, thank you so yes, much for doing it. Yes, lovely to talk it. to you. 
Yeah. Drop yeah. your handles. Where can people find your stuff and your music? Uh, so um, on Twitter, I'm at the nanny state, which is t- uh, the and then nanny n a n i and then state. The British style. Uh, and- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, you can find my music is wrong circles. So that's wrong w r o n g wrong circles. You can find that on on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube and uh i also post songs on on twitter quite often i write songs about uh, about mutuals on twitter and post them so you can find those as well fantastic check out wrong circles give nanny state a follow give heavy board a follow listeners this has been another episode of heavy board and we'll see you later that's brilliant <laughs>